Yeah, yeah, it all happened very accidentally. Um, we played a gig with a really underqualified uh, sound man and uh, he just didn't turn my microphone on so I just had to shout. Now I'm trying to shout less. Yeah, we never like consciously thought, let's be a punk band. It, um, it kind of just happened that way, I think. Pretty soon after Bright Greenfield, which was our first album, came out. Um, and during that time, the UK was still in a kind of pandemic, uh, country-wide lockdown. So as we started to come out of it, they let gigs kind of happen incrementally, whereby the first ones were seated gigs, where you had to be kind of an audience of only about 50 to 100 people. And we just wanted to kind of show people what we'd been working on as a band and kind of a lot of that music was instrumental um, at that time we were just kind of doing these shows which would have extended jams and like we'd go into quite sort of endless cathartic um, <laughs> riffing for a while and yeah some of the music took quite a long time to get to the point that it is on O Monolith um, some of the music we were writing right up until we started pressing record at Real World Studios um, and some of it was kind of finished and we were then just touring it regularly and letting the live set kind of help the tracks grow which is quite typical for us um, but the music was kind of an amalgam of two years worth of creativity whereas Bright Green Field was you know ideas that had been kicking around in the barrel for quite a long time I totally, totally agree with, with everything there, yeah. <laughs> you painted a perfect picture. Of it was a perfect, life. yeah, conjuring <laughs> of what was going on at the time. <laughs> Trying not to repeat ourselves and coming up with new ways to, to structure, structure tracks and try and write lyrics that... Um, that, that you feel that haven't been touched upon by by other people. Just kind of striving to be original, really, although that's quite an impossible task in, in the year 2023. But um, I think as long as you're aiming for that, then that's kind of, that's kind of good enough, really. We find it quite difficult as a band to preserve the structures that seem so right at the outset of the tunes kind of composition um, I think we've all got relatively bad attention spans at times so we'll often kind of start an idea that we feel really excited about and then kind of come back and say this one needs a total overhaul and I think sometimes that's a really good thing and sometimes it's kind of you know, maybe we're overthinking things. And I think that's something that we're getting better at, you know, as time goes on, and we'll probably continue to make more records to kind of know when a good thing is finished and to be able to say this idea is complete. Um, but at the same time, you know, there is no such thing as creating the perfect piece of music. So I guess if you want to keep going with it, keep rearranging it until, you know, until the cows come home then, You've got to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We were chatting the other day about um, about rearranging a track that's on O Monolith that isn't even released yet, playing it differently to how it is on the record. But no one's heard that track, <laughs> so it's like <laughs> it's quite like uh, I don't know. It's quite funny that we we just constantly want to move on, even if even. <laughs> Uh, no, I think that was Devil's Day. Uh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I see, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Like, not, not, like, even before these tracks have been released, they're kind of almost ready to move on. Yeah. Which is a, is a dangerous thing sometimes, but sometimes it's uh, necessary. I think it is it's all COVID's fault in the yeah, sense it's that... it's all COVID's fault. Everything is COVID's fault, because now we're touring music, that some of which we wrote a really long time ago, 
But yeah, as well, he was just saying, no one's heard it yet. And they're just like, give me the studio version and just play it note for note, <laughs> which is probably what people will want. Yeah. And we're like, maybe we should just put the drum machine back in this. And then actually, I might just not play my guitar for the whole song. <laughs> and it could just maybe just be a cappella. Yeah, yeah. Barbershop quartet. Yeah. We need to know Sweet when up. our ideas are bad. <laughs> It was quite an uphill battle trying to figure out what what style the singing should be and and how to sing because I've never really had any like training on it um, and I probably do things that are very bad for my voice um, but yeah it was really nice and like it, it feels really good now that it's done that I can listen back to it and say that I'm, I'm quite I'm, I'm pretty proud of it. Mm. And uh, yeah, I definitely got a few grey hairs, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's thinking. <laughs> yeah, and I suppose as well, like, we knew once we'd recorded this album that there was a much deeper kind of pool of texture instrumentally than there had been with Bright Green Field. And the kind of question that springs to mind then is how do you mix all of these parts in a way where you have enough breathing space and that there isn't a kind of like dominant force of you know bass or drums kind of providing the sort of foundation upon which the rest of the track is built which definitely is a, a kind of formula that I think has worked for us before but this time round we wanted to work with John McIntyre who mixed the record who was just able to kind of give everything such effortless space in the mix especially in moments like you pointed out earlier on how I think there's like a moment in the blades when there's about 14 different people's worth of sound happening all that on the same beat it's like how do you even go about that and John coming from the background of having played in bands like Tortoise which are such rich sonic um, kind of exhibitions of, of music he just kind of sent us the mix first pass and was just like Hey, you go. It's like, oh great, you don't really need much direction here. You've just kind of managed to feel what we could have said in words. And obviously you give direction here and there when you need to, but it's ultimately a, um, a very kind of automatic process from John and his mixing of the music. But yeah, definitely like to a, to a kind of uh, a normal uh, kind of gig when you play a new track you can kind of just feel the, that the audience are enjoying it or sometimes mm. maybe not enjoying it but then it's hard as well because like where do you how do you figure out if someone just kind of sat like stood there going like that is like what are they, what are they thinking well this is the thing it's like, so weird no <laughs> and it's like as we've discovered by putting more emotion into some of our music that's more static and it isn't necessarily constructed around chaos breaking down into kind of like absolute freak out, like was a formula that we used to use quite a lot and quite rely on quite a lot. There's music, I think, especially on this new album that we're releasing, where there's a lot of emotion in very still moments. And I think starting to play those songs, you can kind of see and feel people that are engaging just as much as if they were jumping around in the mosh pit or whatever, but they're just like stood still. And I think coming to terms with the fact that that's good feedback as much as someone dancing is, <laughs> is, is, um, is yeah. something important. Felt like a bit of an imposter. Cause, cause yeah, it, was, definitely. <laughs> it was like a giant studio and, uh, and, uh, yeah, somewhere where I never thought we'd we'd record. Mm. Um, I guess you must have like driven past it quite a lot when you were younger and wondered. Did you ever go inside as a kid? No, I didn't go inside. But um, on the way to, I used to work at a supermarket um, not too far from the studio, and on the train you can see it when you go past, and it kind of looks like a Bond, like a Bond <laughs> villain's yeah. like layer yeah. or something, or like Max Power from The Simpsons. Um, yeah, it's like, it's a really incredible building. It's like an old um, converted water mill. 
um, and there's nature around everywhere which definitely informed the uh, the sound of the record um, amazing team as well like all the people working there seem such kind of like a nice family mm. you know like we worked the, the kind of in-house engineer who was working on our project was called Dominic Shaw and he just like his knowledge of the environment that he was in you know everything from the desk to like a cupboard that you can find a dustpan and brush in he kind of had this <laughs> encyclopedic <laughs> knowledge we definitely needed that dustpan and brush yeah, because, yeah. Um, and I think our chaotic way of working sometimes when we're really kind of in full swing of you know the album there were moments where I'd kind of pan my eyes around to Dom and he'd just be like okay <laughs> they're going, going a bit crazy again <laughs> but um, yeah such, such a good group of people kind of at the helm of this amazing recording studio yeah, it's a real, yeah. real kind of like honour to have done the record there really when we were recording the demo for Swing in a Dream at J&J in Bristol which is run by a friend called Jim Barr we were playing the track all of a sudden Jim comes out and he's holding these two red giant apples and he's saying stop you're going to want to put these apples in we were like what are you talking about he comes out with the apples gives them a little ring and it's like this amazing kind of chimey sound that has a stereo effect when it's over each ear so we're like okay cool we'll put the put the apples in in the intro when Arthur's playing his riff on keyboard um, made the demo loved it showing it to friends and family they were saying what's that amazing kind of synth sound at the beginning that Arthur's doing it's like it's not a synth it's apple chimes um, so we go to real world about three months later record the the proper studio version with Dan and Lex and Dom and then it was only when we mixed it and sent it off to mastering and the, the deed was done that I was like oh, there was a version of this that was really good and it had those apples in from J&J &J. so anyway it was too late the apples you know they couldn't be added at that point it had been this is gone, gone. this is a blink, blink in the eye missed <laughs> um, so if anyone had known to ask yeah. where was the apple and where were the apples then I would have thought that's very well remembered because that was my favourite part of the demo yeah we're going to put it on the um, the 20th anniversary version of O Monolith when it comes out yeah the red apple demo the red apple demo it's got such a ring to it 